Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kelsey De Rinaldis. I'm the Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer at the US Embassy in Tokyo. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual celebration of World Intellectual Property Day around the theme of From Patent to Patient, Intellectual Property's Role in Innovative Healthcare. The US Embassy is hosting today's program to explore how intellectual property enables the next generation of medical services and is particularly important for small and medium-sized enterprises. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that today's event is on the record and will be recorded. There will be English and Japanese simultaneous interpretation. Captioning for today's program is available at the UD Talk app or in your web browser directly. Instructions for connecting were sent out prior to today's event and can also be found in the chat box shortly. We have our um, Japanese sign language interpreters joining us as well. Additionally, during today's program, we will be conducting audience polling. We encourage you to participate and it is completely anonymous. So now I would like to invite you all to engage with us in some audience polling questions. This helps us, helps us to understand who is in the audience and your thoughts on today's topic. The polling question should now pop up on your screen. Again, your answers are anonymous. So we encourage you to participate. We will give you a few moments to answer. For those joining via Facebook or other platforms, there are three questions. The first question asks, do you or your organization currently hold patents, copyrights, trademarks, or other legal protections for your intellectual property? The second question asks, what type of assistance would most help you or your organization to seek and implement intellectual property rights protections? And the third question asks, what is the most urgent threat to intellectual property in Japan? I'll give you just a few more moments to answer. All right, thank you all so much. I'm going to go ahead and end our polling so that I can share the results with everyone. You should see the results now on your screen. So it looks like there are quite a few that don't have any legal protections currently in place. So we'll be talking much more about that today at our event. So thank you for joining. Um, it looks like the type of assistance that is most necessary uh, now is information on how to identify intellectual property and file for protection. And it looks like the ur most urgent threat to intellectual property in Japan is the lack of understanding about the necessity of having intellectual property rights in place. So perfect, we definitely um, will be covering each of those topics today. So thank you so much for sharing your opinions with us as we prepare to start the event. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Steve Lang, our Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs, who will offer his opening remarks. Following his remarks, we will share a short video featuring three Japanese medical technology startups on how they navigate the global intellectual property system and use innovation to power growth in the healthcare sector and beyond. So Steve, over to you. Thank you, Kelsey. It's a pleasure to be here with so many small business leaders and champions of intellectual property rights to celebrate World Intellectual Property Day. 
The global pandemic has forced us to disrupt the way that we've traditionally worked. This event is a good example of how intellectual property helps us to problem solve. We're holding this event on a platform that invested heavily in communications technology in the years leading up to 2020. The licensing agreement that protects that investment benefits this group by allowing us to gather glitch free, I hope, across time zones. In this case, intellectual property isn't only helping us to problem solve, it's opening up new opportunities as well. I'm excited that a new format lets us hear directly from small businesses all over Japan that are developing the next generation of healthcare services. Healthcare has certainly been at the forefront of our minds this past year. The protection provided by patents, trademarks, and copyrights enabled companies to plow money into research and development. We're seeing the payoff from that risk taking in the form of vaccines and new treatments for COVID-19. But intellectual property in healthcare goes beyond vaccine developments. Small businesses have an important role to play in improving on healthcare delivery. Because they're more agile, small businesses are able to plug into, to, into existing medical infrastructure, identify gaps, and tailor technology to meet urgent patient needs. The facts bear this out. Small and micro entity patent filings in the United States were the historic high during 2020, with more than 112,000 filings during the first 11 months of the fiscal year. During the pandemic, we saw small and medium sized enterprises rise to the occasion to provide a host of medical technologies that supported at risk patients, contact tracers, diagnosticians, and frontline healthcare workers. Japan and the United States have a long history of collaboration on these cutting edge medical technologies, and there's room for growth. Healthcare expenditure as a percent of GDP comes in at 11% for Japan and 18% for the United States, as compared to an OECD average of 8.8%. Both countries are facing rising healthcare costs, aging populations, and patients who demand the type of personalized, interoperable, and holistic products that SMEs are well positioned to provide. Japan and the United States have an equally long history of promoting intellectual property rights by ensuring that creators can use the global system of IPR protection to profit from their innovation and seek redress for infringements. The United States Embassy is proud to host this event based on the World Intellectual Property Organization's theme of intellectual property and SMEs, taking your ideas to market. And I look forward to hearing from our entrepreneurs and experts. Thank you very much for joining us. So what we do in our business is to invite Japanese medical doctors. About 40% of the doctors participate on the internet community. We provide various business services. The MediFrame is the information provider about drug and treatment to pharmaceutical companies, medical doctors, and patients to maximize the drug impact. The health tech industry experiences rapid change and growth, not infringing others' rights in creating content and also protecting your own rights of inventors understanding what other companies are doing, all of these are required for us to continue to operate. Based on the insight of our experiences working on the front line of medical industry, we can generate ideas, we consult with stakeholders, take a deep delve into challenges, and the result will be discussed with patent lawyers as we try to file for our patents.
our business is there to generate new values for us to stay competitive in protecting our property right. This is an important factor for us. The market will exceed the, its threshold and grow very rapidly. And at that moment, IP for key product or service uh, will play a very important role. So we have to prepare for that moment from now. Prescription information will be tied to the latest drug information, and this system has been protected by our patent. This is a system that based on that is based on the deep knowledge of clinical information. We are trying to maximize IP values from state of art technology. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Drug evaluation bullet point folder is available for member doctors to be able to share prescription experiences with other doctors. This idea is unique to us. Comments are given by doctors. Each comment is protected because each one of these comments has a copyright. So together with doctors, we can create joint values. Our inventions should be connected to health tech industry. And this is how we try to make the best use of IPs. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Uh, and that helped you understand how intellectual property benefits small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. Yo Iwami, President and CEO of MedPeer Inc. for his keynote remarks. MedPeer was listed on the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange last year and is a leading venture company in the Japanese health tech industry. Today, Dr. Iwami, who is both a doctor and an entrepreneur, will be speaking from the standpoint of a business manager about the importance of intellectual property rights in the rapidly rising field of the Japanese health technology industry. So Dr. Iwami, over to you. Hi. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I would like to now begin my presentation. Once again, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Yo Iwami, CEO of MedPeer Incorporated. I would like to thank you for the honor that has been extended to me to participate in this program today. This is the agenda by which I hope to be able to speak. And as uh, has been mentioned, I am not an expert on IP-related matters. I am a physician to begin with, and I'm also uh, in business. And therefore, uh, I'm undertaking measures on IP. And also, on every year, uh, we also host a massive event on healthcare. And because of this uh, flow of activities, I'm looking at how uh, healthcare has been highlighted as of recent and also the importance of intellectual property. First of all, I'd like to introduce MedPeer, our company. As I mentioned earlier, to begin with, from Tokyo Women's uh, Medical Hospital, I am a respiratory uh, doctor and I've uh, in, began the business very recently and uh, there's an emphasis on mi mission the re reason for very existence of the company, which is supporting doctors and helping patients. MedPeer Group, of course, this indicates the reason for the very existence of the company. It is important to support the doctors and also to rescue 
patients. There are 260 members uh, that have uh, joined us in this effort to keep our business going. And this mission has materialized in this uh, system to help support the doctors. And there needs to be a community that is uh, uh, dedicated to uh, physicians. In 2004, we began business, and uh, 2007, we have uh, launched this service. And as you can see, one in every three, and by the way, uh, are already participating on this platform. The number comes to 120,000 doctors, and within the internet community, this is a fairly unique service, and we have the so-called drug evaluation bulletin board in which the doctors will be uh, looking at uh, drugs from the perspective of uh, physicians. I think of the Tabilog, which is the app uh, to for uh, customers to post their reviews on restaurants and eateries. So it's the healthcare version. I talked about the supporting doctors. And in order to materialize on this, uh, we have been able to create the community of doctors. The breadth have uh, expanded as of recent. There are basically three pillars that I like to uh, go over. As an assumption, of course, that we are dedicated to healthcare, and we will develop on our services based on healthcare because of the mission that we have uh, upheld. From that perspective, we have to look at the life course of, of a person, uh, which is comprised of well being before one, there is an onset of disease, and then after the onset of disease, and ultimately terminal care. Of course, uh, we are uh, destined to close our lives at one point in time. And we have services for self-care and also the conventional medical services. And we also have the home care, nursing care, uh, which are already in existence as a service. These are the services that have been rolled out by MedPeer. We also have the collective uh, intelligence, which we refer to as a PEF platform. And this is an uh, aggregation of uh, experts, uh, the physician, and this is the platform. And these constitute the pillar of our business at Medpeer. We also have the dietitian uh, services for the dietitian as well as the pharmacist that we have also recently lo lo rolled out. And the second pillar is a self-care to better our lives, which we have uh, placed an emphasis. And we have the preventive care platform. It's the B2B2C to help support health management in companies. And also down below, we have the smartphone app, and which is like a pedometer. And uh, this is something that we have uh, conducted in conjunction with Nikkei. And so we also have these types of B2C services as well. So this is a second set of services. And the other is very characteristic of the DNA of Medipir, in which uh, uh, we go into more uh, uh, sophisticated levels. This is for like the home doctor or the uh, home pharmacy. I'm sure that you've heard about these concepts. And this is to help support the home doctors as well as the home uh, pharmacists. It's a B2B to C. It takes the form of an app. And I did mention this up front. As we have introduced, uh, we are an IT company. And as, as I mentioned, in the United States, not just limited to intellectual property, there are dynamic challenges that have emerged in the healthcare industry. 2007, Indu uh, Savaya and Matthew Holt uh, together have uh, come to host Health version 2.0. And this has uh, really brought to me a sense of crisis. It was very stimulating because I've come to acknowledge that uh, there's not adequate challenges uh, within uh, Japan. And therefore, we have uh, believed that it is important to instill a movement. 2015, that's six years ago, Medhir has come to host the health tech event here in Japan. On this event, Mr. Erlington, uh, from the US Embassy here in Japan have also helped to host uh, this uh, symposium. We have also entered into a joint collaboration with Nikkei, with Health Tech Sum, uh, which, uh, we has begun, which has begun in December of 2020. This event for startups and ventures uh, ourselves and also large players such as Docomo, and also uh, those from the bureaucratic uh, uh, field 
as well as insurances, uh, life insurance, and also venture capital. Uh, anyone who is informed, who is engaged in one form or other in healthcare, uh, at congregate at this uh, event. Now I'd like to focus on the developing Japanese healthcare industry here in Japan. We must understand that COVID has had serious implications, and as a result, in a sense, it has uh, given us, given the healthcare industry, a push. But even before COVID-19, we have come to sense that uh, the health tech industry has grabbed the spotlight as one unexplored industry that promises growth. Uh, what is the backdrop? Well, one that has been pointed out is the tight finances and also the universal healthcare system that is uh, specific to Japan uh, is now confronted by limitations on what can, it can do. And also society, uh, we are uh, the most advanced, the super aged society. And also another factor with COVID-19, we have seen uh, the progression of uh, the spread of smartphones, those above 70 years of age, half of this uh, elderly segment already possesses a smartphone. So we find that the mobile devices or smartphones are really spreading. And therefore the elderly have now more uh, contact with uh, smartphones and such devices. And there have been deregulation of, uh, of uh, say consultations and e-prescriptions, which also means that the conditions are ripe. And this is from Initial. Uh, we have a, a, we are citing from their database. To the left, we have the number of uh, companies in the health tech industry. To the right, uh, this is the progress in financing that we have seen over the years. And uh, we are looking at to the left on a five-year segment, and we find that the number of companies have actually startup companies have increased. In 2019, 2020, it's only a single year's worth, so it's not that large. But last year within COVID-19, we have seen uh, activities put to a halt. And therefore, the number of uh, uh, on startups have uh, declined. And then to the right, we are looking at a procurement of, in terms of financing. And now turning our eyes to the U.S., and this is cited from uh, data from Deloitte Tomatsu. In 2019-2020, we have seen the healthcare funding, health tech funding, double, even though it has uh, put to a halt in Japan, and which also indicates, well, regardless of who is right or wrong, uh, this indicates uh, very characteristically the very contrasting uh, approaches uh, taken to health tech funding, U.S. and Japan. And I've uh, indicated that has been uh, put to a halt last year here in Japan. However, we are seeing a restart of activities in Japan and therefore in health tech industry here in Japan. Uh, it, we do not expect it to shrink. It's just been a temporarily halt. And in moving forward, we expect it to increase. And this is not just limited to ventures. So we are looking at the so-called mega ventures uh, with big names such as SoftBank and Docomo. And we also have uh, other names such as Sony, who, which are looking at the health tech uh, industry and have stepped into the market. Uh, these are uh, industries that were considered alien. However, now these are the industries that have stepped uh, into the market. For example, SoftBank has uh, stepped into the online uh, medical consultation, a huge company. Uh, NTD document also M3 have also formed an alliance in this segment as well. So this indicates a number of startups and also the uh, entry of uh, mega ventures. And uh, this will uh, stimulate a trigger uh, active activity in this uh, segment. So if you look at this health tech industry in Japan, this applies to all of the businesses a company has to comply with rules, but especially this healthcare industry has direct relations to life and death. So I believe that these five factors are extremely important. First comes compliance. We have PDM Act, medical doctors rules that they are obliged to comply with because this is a life and death matter. And also ethics one may have to deal with genetics. So ethics plays an important role. And quality assurance is taken for granted in this sector. And security, especially recently, we have embedded devices used for medical devices. The fibrillator is a good example. 
this can be possibly hacked by rogue criminals. So we have to have high security level for medical devices. So this will gain more attention going forward. And the last, the fifth factor is intellectual property. Ventures need to defend themselves. IP rights can also help them to protect themselves. And on the offensive side, they can utilize IP rights to promote healthy development of the industry, venture being able to make a positive growth, explosive growth because of that. So if I'd like to look at the healthcare industry and how IP will help this industry to grow. So when it comes to IP, as you can see, what comes to our mind is patient, especially in this medical and healthcare industry. Patents would be most important. Other than that, we have utility models, readers' rights, design, copyrights, and trademarks, and so forth. We have the IP Basic Act, and I have quoted one line from the Article 2 of this Act. It said that IP is eventually the information different companies do use information. And there are multiple rules that are written on the information that healthcare companies can possibly use. And this is what is summarized in this picture. The source of information is at the bottom of this illustration. The information that encompasses medical services is wide ranging. We have bioinformatics. We also have clinical research informatics. We also have public health informatics as well. We, as medical doctors or researchers, do use information for the lab, for experiments. And on the clinical phase, we have to understand how the drugs that are being developed impact the human bodies. in the process of drug development and medical device development. A recent change that we see is the advancement of computation and statistics. And because of the COVID-19, medical doctors pay more attention to the importance of public health and that is why they are shifting from bedside to community. If you look at the service areas, this community area represents a major growth area. So there is a major shift from the concept of bench to bedside to bedside to community. So what is community? What is this community? Community is basically made of general consumers. So the health tech industry has to have this idea of community right in the center. And what is supporting this shift is this, as you can see on this slide. There is a medical policy of the government and health tech industries moves are lined up together. We have universal health insurance, my number system, individual identification system started in 2015. And this propelled the shift from pay for service to pay for value. How can we define this value? Value comes from information. One may provide a service. What is the impact? What is the result of that service? That has to be described in data the value. In the health tech industry, we had the online receipt system. We also had the online diagnosis, which started last year, and online health identification will start. 
as you might know, personal health record, PHR, in 2021, in October, for the very first time, because of the guidance of national government, individual will be able to control their medical diagnostic information. Finally, each one of us will have the ownership of our own individual medical information. And there will be increasing number of companies who will make use of this system. And there will be new inventions, which is, of course, promoted by the national government. So this is the area of we health tech companies are focused on. As I mentioned earlier, the research will have a community as a center. There will be a lot of shift moving toward community of consumers. Clinical test is not an exception. There will be medical checks to understand whether the drug has been effective or not. That is the conventional model. But eventually, we will have the patients right in the center for clinical tests as well. The patients do not have to come to hospitals to participate in the clinical test. I think this trend is going to be accelerated, not just in Japan, but in the United States as well. This is an interesting example. This is a collaboration with healthcare company with non-healthcare industry player. AstraZeneca, Astellas and Bandai Namco, a gate company, are collaborating on this. This was unconventional and unthinkable collaboration because patients are encouraged to change their behaviors to improve their health. This is our effort. We are working with Nikkei newspaper, Nikkei Inc. This is a well-known animation character using this character to encourage patients to change their daily behaviors. So collaboration will be enhanced. Deroyd gave us this information. We have the fundamental technologies such as smartphone, data analysis, and also the government guidance and promotion. Because of that technology that were only used in the medical diagnosis will be applied to many more applications. Medical institutions will have to pay to take care of patients, but this platform will cover a wider range of target people because it deals with preventive medicine, diagnosis, and so forth. This is the conventional world, bench to bedside world where we focused only on drug-based patents. But as I mentioned, when we move to bedside community, there will be a lot of collaboration between medical companies and non-traditional health players. There will be unknowing infringing trademarks and patents. So there will be more targets to be covered in trying to protect the rights. I have two more slides before I close. As I mentioned, inventions are critically important. Invention, innovation are going to change the health tech industry. Let me show you this slide once again. There are five factors that we need to comply or oblige. And as I mentioned earlier, IP can be utilized to take an offense, to be proactive, or to be defensive, to protect your own company. So what we do, as I said at the outset, we have 260 employees in our company. And because of that size, we do not have the existing stationary IP lawyers. But we do believe that long-term strategy for IP protection is critical for us. So we need to be constantly aware of the intellectual property right. There is a group who is in charge of intellectual property rights. 
we actually launch double digit number of new services we have to make sure that every new service we launch does not infringe others rights and as we develop we come up with inventions before we launch a service we have to make sure whether the, that is that involves the invention that needs to be protected or not so we have to have a proper design of incentives so that we can give those incentives to the employees who contribute to IP. So IP group and developers department need to be able to collaborate closely together. Of course, we have to make a decision whether we should apply for patents right or not, but this collaboration is the basis for that type of decision. As we see healthcare industry developing rapidly, there will be new unconventional players coming in this market. So this IP strategy is going to be a critical part of a management. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Iwami. Now I'd like to turn to my um, The pleasure is mine. Now I would like to turn to my colleague, Erin Forsberg, our Counselor for Trade and Economic Policy at US Embassy Tokyo, who will introduce and moderate our panel. So Erin, over to you. Thank you, Kelsey, and uh, everyone. It's really a pleasure to join you today alongside such a distinguished panel of uh, experts. Uh, and to my fellow panelists, I wish to thank you for your uh, time today and sharing your wide ranging expertise. Um, as we have seen already, healthcare innovation has a huge role to play in the post COVID economy. Governments are seeking to fill gaps in data collection and exchange. National healthcare systems have recognized the importance of at home delivery and service provision. Customers are taking control of their medical bio data through mobile apps. And as you saw this morning, uh, we have heard from entrepreneurs who have the ideas and the ambition to build out this new healthcare ecosystem. I'm hoping that our roundtable uh, this morning will speak to the last piece of the puzzle, how Japanese small businesses like theirs can put their intellectual property to work. And to start off the conversation, I will turn to Dr. Takanaka. She is a professor of technology law at the University of Washington Law School of Law, and she is a visiting professor at Keio University Law School. She has served as a patent prosecutor. She has published extensively on comparative law, and she is a leading authority on the uh, systems of the United States, Japan, and the European Union patent systems. Dr. Takenaka? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Please kindly project my slide. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Once again, I would like to introduce myself. I am Toshiko Takenaka, Professor at University of Washington School of Law and also Keio University Law School. Please kindly turn to the next slide. Generally, what I do is go back and forth between Japan and the United States, and therefore, from drawing on my experience, I would like to talk about the difference between the United States and Japan when it comes to healthcare ventures, especially among the SMEs. In the case of the United States, when uh, researchers uh, start healthcare ventures, we find that the, in the early stage, the angel investors will step up. They will assist. And later on, the venture capitals will assist once the business risk is mitiga mitigated. And thereafter, there have been an assessment on the investment business risk. And investment will come along as well as advice. 
IPO and also M&A would follow, and this will deliver the uh, exit opportunity for such investors. So what is happening here in Japan? In Japan, ventures are basically government-led. There are, of course, angel investors and also venture capitals, capitalists. And also, as Dr. Iwami has uh, mentioned, and has, has put it very successfully, the number compared to the United States is very, very uh, small. However, the Japanese government will offer finances and also offer advice in the way of experiences as well as IP strategy and measures are taken. To put it in a nutshell, the private sector and also the government will work as a team so that innovation will materialize into success. And therefore, while in the United States, after businesses succeed, the investors will engage in business and that could serve as a risk. However, uh, that risk does not exist here in Japan. However, uh, it could also, the downside could mean that uh, Japanese entities will suffer in terms of competitiveness. And uh, please turn to the next slide. Ministries and agencies provide numerous programs to help small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, especially for healthcare startups. And what is uh, extremely important as a way of support is the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare uh, Program, which operates the MEDISO, or Medical Innovation Support Center, and the Japan Patent Office operates IPAS, or Intellectual Property Acceleration Program for startups, and both of which provide support for financing, business management, and also IPR management, which is uh, critical for healthcare ventures. And Dr. Iwami has uh, mentioned that what is important and crucial is access to information, and the information will be made available by the so-called supporters under the program. And Japan Patent Office also offers a support, not just for healthcare, but for a broad range of businesses. And uh, unlike the United States, in Japan, there's a utility model system for small and medium-sized enterprises. So. Uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises will be able to enjoy discounts on filing fees and also will be able to enjoy priority or accelerated examination. And that is how the Japan Patent Office is actively uh, supporting the small and medium-sized enterprises to register their inventions as a patent right or as a utility model right. Please um, move, like to move on and uh, please present the next slide. In recent years, uh, pardon me, if we could just go back a slide. In recent years in Japan, uh, once again, could you kindly uh, go back a slide? Thank you very much. We also find that here in Japan, there are also private sector-led ventures that have uh, come into the picture. And as you can see here, uh, these will represent the picture. There is the IP declaration to fight against COVID-19. This is led by Kyoto University, and more than 100 universities and private centers have uh, united forces to declare that they will not exercise patent rights for the more than 120,000 patents we use for diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of COVID-19 in the drive to end the pandemic. The declaration says that they will not exercise patent rights. It is not clear to what extent these patents are actually being used for the purpose. The use of patent rights is not made mandatory, and there are concerns that the patent holders will exercise their rights once the pandemic is under control, and hence the use of rights are generally not disclosed. But insiders have uh, informed me that uh, it is these uh, patents have been utilized to quite an extent well, pharmaceutical companies are not participating, and uh, Dr. Iomi also made mention of cross-sector cooperation by tapping into healthcare technology and commercializing on that technology. And we also find the high-tech companies uh, have also have a dedicated department for healthcare. And therefore, we are seeing the emergence of uh, anti-COVID-19 measures. Just to give an example, there's a Canada Medical System 
in Nagasaki University have jointly developed a means by which to detect the new coronavirus from just one saliva sample in a mere 10 minutes. This is a, a public partner public-private academia partnership and such a partnership have emerged in and uh, to deliver on a means to combat COVID-19. However, when it comes to vaccines as well as a uh, uh, treatment, uh, these have not yet unfortunately materialized into commercialization. Uh, this is because fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Japan does not have uh, many COVID-19 cases. The cases are very, very limited and hence uh, they have not been able to recruit the required number of uh, subjects to conduct a clinical trial. And hence, uh, to this day, not a single approval has been granted. Could you turn a slide, please? And lastly, I would like to talk about the initiatives that have been taken by the national government. Here in Japan, we have angels, ventures, uh, the numbers are very, very small. And therefore, the startups find it very, very difficult to procure financing from the private sector. And also, major companies also are confronted by the risk of litigation from patent rules. And therefore, uh, there is a, a negative uh, approach that is uh, basically uh, taken. And hence, by participating as a member of the uh, intellectual property headquarters at the cabinet office, we are trying to find a means to combat this situation. It is important to put together a cluster of uh, experts, dedicated experts. What is the subject of their assessment? Private companies will need to disclose their technology to investment investors, and therefore there be intangible assets on top of the so-called traditional tangible assets, which will be disclosed. And this will help to boost the value of, uh, of corporates. And for startups, this will help to them to facilitate procurement of finances. And for major companies, it will, this will be a means by which to facilitate a procurement of financing. And this is the type of mechanism that is currently being devised. Of course, what is critical is the vis visualization of intangible assets. Disclosure of intangibles could enhance corporate value and encourage investment from home and abroad. And therefore, Japanese companies, the top management, and also investors need to be vigilant about intangible assets, inclusive of, of course, intellectual property rights, and take a more positive stance. There needs to be a change in mindset. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers for the very valuable opportunity that has been given to me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Takanaka. Uh, in particular, uh, your emphasis on how intellectual property is at the core of those intangible assets that are so important for uh, valuing companies and uh, providing them a way forward uh, to get financing and to grow, to provide services for, uh, for, for the uh, community that Dr. Iwami spoke about. Uh, next, I would like to turn to Professor O'Connor for his take. Uh, we're really lucky to have such a subject matter expert with us today. Professor O'Connor uh, specializes his research in intellectual property and business law, and uh, in particular, how it applies to startups and the commercialization of technology. Professor O'Connor is a professor of law and executive director of the Center for Protection of Intellectual Property at George Mason University in, the United States, in Virginia. Professor O'Connor? Great, thank you. Honor and a pleasure to be here. Good morning to everyone there. It is of course the evening here in Washington, DC. And I have to say, it's been a great cherry blossom season. 
And as you know, we have those tremendous Japanese cherry trees right here in DC. So we enjoy those every year. I want to talk about three topics to cover the area that is relevant to SMEs and especially in the health tech and medical environment. As an overview, the first one is about how intellectual property enables the commercialization pathway. This is critical. A lot of my comments will be from the US perspective because that is what I'm most familiar with. So please bear with me on this and understand whether this works for the Japanese culture as well. I understand there are significant differences. The second category I will talk about is how to build intellectual property portfolios, especially on a limited budget, which SMEs will have. They can't patent everything. So how do you choose what to focus your limited resources on? The third category will be about how intellectual property is an enticement for investors to invest in your business. Both early stage investors like angel and venture capitalists, but also big companies that will then invest in and then maybe even acquire all or a substantial part of your company if you are successful. In the first category, the commercialization pathways, it's important to realize that intellectual property simply is the legal title that defines the innovation that you have. Without such legal title, no one can really know what you have. And more importantly, it's very hard to convey it. Think about if you didn't have title to your land, if you own property, if you own a condominium or a house, if there was no legal title, how would you transfer rights to that? Who would know what you own? The title says, defines what the property is. So critically then, the first step, once you have the innovation, is to start thinking about defining it and then protecting it through intellectual property. Let's talk about the typical value chain in medical. Now, I, I really enjoyed Dr. Wowie's presentation where he talked about bedside to community as well. Because he's right that normally we talk about just bench, laboratory research bench to bedside. But this bringing it out into the community is, of course, amazingly important. And it's where all of the digital side, the bioinformatics side is really going. It's bringing it out to the whole community, connecting medical innovation with public health. When we think about that value chain, it still often starts with a university or a nonprofit research center. And then that comes up with some basic science research results. But those have to be translated into something that looks like a product or service that can be developed to the market. Because the basic science research result simply tells us how something works in the state of nature. What we really need to know is then how to intervene in that process. So an example I often use is researchers discovering how cancer tumors grow. If they discover how that occurs naturally, then in the translational phase, bioengineering, pharmaceutical, other kinds of researchers can then come up with ideas for how to intervene, how to slow down the growth of that tumor. That's the translational phase. Now we have something that we can start saying that looks like a potential product. Is it going to be a drug, a vaccine, a diagnostic, a medical device? All these things are then translated from the basic science research. And here's the problem. If you're going to get money to do that translational exercise, and to be able to develop the proof of concept of a product or a service, you will need to then secure some rights so that investors have confidence that if you develop that, someone else can't come in and just steal it. So perhaps at the most basic level, you just need trade secrets. Secrecy, privacy, that is a form of intellectual property. 
And that is arguably one of the most important ones. So you should always be thinking about whatever you've innovated as keeping it private, keeping it secret until you can secure some patent protection or find other ways to talk about it without fully disclosing it. So in that first step of the value chain, there could be a patent or at least know-how developed at a university or a nonprofit. And that then is defined by the legal rights and then transferred over, sold or licensed to the translational company, often the SME, that will come up with the proof of concept of a good or service. And then if that proof of concept stage is successful, then it will be further sold or licensed to a big manufacturing company. But again, the way those transactions happen is through some form of intellectual property. The big company is important because they not only have the manufacturing capability, but also the regulatory compliance capability to get the drug or the medical device approved. And they also provide the distribution. Think about vaccines, the current COVID vaccines that are very perishable. They, they do not last long. And so distribution is very important. Okay, now the two major commercialization pathways then are the initial firm, the SME, just simply secures the intellectual property to license out to a big company. That's the model I was just talking about. But it's also true that some SMEs will want to get bigger themselves and then do the manufacturing and distribution. That will take a lot more capital. And then the intellectual property is even more important. But it's important in both pathways. Moving on to the second major topic, how do you decide about your IP portfolio? Universities, your SME, there may be many inventions that your researchers have come up with. You will not be able to afford to patent them all. Patents are expensive. So how do you decide? Well, the first thing is to start thinking, as you're, probably your researchers and your marketing people are already thinking, in terms of the product or the technology. So patents are a little artificial because they cover a particular improvement a particular new way of doing something, but that's not the same thing as a whole medical device or even a whole drug. So you need to think then about what is the technology we're doing and then how do you then build a portfolio around that? There'll be tough choices. Again, it's critical to think about protecting things as trade secrets until you can make these portfolio decisions. Also keep in mind that if you're operating in the bioinformatics space or anything else using software, then patents are often not your main tool of intellectual property. Instead, it's often copyrights or again, trade secrets and then contracts that will then bind the end user to not do certain things and disclose your, your code to others. So you have to look at the whole range, patents, trade secrets, copyright. And I think we'll talk a little bit more in the program about trademarks. So I won't talk about that here, but trademarks are critical for developing your brand and your reputation in the marketplace. Now, also when you're building your portfolio, it can be very helpful to focus on patents that have multiple fields of use. So let's say you have a diagnostic tool and it can identify a few different disorders or diseases. You are only going to commercialize one of those, let's say. So you can keep that one to yourself, but you can license others to then develop the other fields of use. So let's say you want to, let's say it's something for autoimmune diseases and you want to cover arthritis, but somebody else can cover something like asthma or allergies. And so then you can license out and make money in the meantime. So don't forget that you can use your intellectual property to make money from other businesses, developing things that you won't have time to develop while you're still developing your main product. Let's move to our third bucket because I, I believe I must be getting out of time here. And I appreciate your indulgence in letting me make this presentation. Intellectual property is key as an enticement for investors to invest in your company. 
Patents are often called signals. They send a signal to people. One of those signals is to your competitors in the marketplace. Once they know you have patents pending or have issued, then they have what we call barriers to entry. They can't just come in, copy exactly what you've done and undercut you. And remember that they can undercut you because they didn't have to pay for all the research and development. You have that cost. You have to pay off that cost. Your competitor who did not, who just copied this from you saved all that money. So they can then sell it at a lower price point and undercut you. So it's key to get that proprietary position to create those barriers to entry to move ahead in the marketplace. Second, a lot of investors, they look to see not just that you have intellectual property for its own sake, but because it's a signal that you were diligent, you understand what you need to do, and you're savvy enough to be able to get that patent protection through the system. Another thing that investors are looking for, however, is they know that unfortunately, most SMEs will fail. In the US, I think we're more comfortable with failure, and maybe that's a national flaw and not a plus, but we're comfortable with the fact that nine out of 10 SMEs will probably fail. So the investors are looking at the IP because that's often the asset that remains when the company fails. Those patents can be then taken by the investor because they often have rights to the assets of the company through their ownership of shares. And then they can license or sell those IP assets to somebody else. A lot of other things the company may hold, some facilities, things like that, are valuable, but often not quite as valuable as a great IP portfolio. Let me conclude my remarks there. And I want to thank you all for your attention. And I do want to thank my former colleague, Dr. Takanaka, who, again, if you have questions about the Japanese system and, and anything else there, she is the person to talk to. I can only tell you about commercialization primarily in the US. Thank you. Thank you, Professor O'Connor. Um, finally, I would like to turn to uh, Mr. Uh, Kugai for his comment. Uh, he represents the small business uh, perspective in this discussion as managing director of the Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mr. Kugai has a wide range of professional experience in industrial policy, both within government at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and JETRO, and in the private sector with companies such as Panasonic. Mr. Kugai. Thank you for the kind introduction. Is my voice projecting? Thank you very much for the introduction. I would like to speak. Uh, I would like to follow this aside. When it comes to the SMEs, there are 3.6 million SMEs in Japan, accounting for 99.7% of all companies here in Japan. It has served as a source of the industrial competitiveness and innovation and local employment playing a role crucial to the Japanese business sector. Please can you turn the page and this indicates uh, measures that have been taken in IP uh, at the Japan Chamber of Commerce. It is important for uh, Japan Chamber of Commerce to play a role, especially for Tokyo Chamber of Commerce with 80,000 members has taken the lead. More than 10 years ago, the IP committee was installed and we have had the top management of uh, companies to join. We have also conducted research over IP, business management, conducted questionnaire surveys to inform the value of IPR to small and medium-sized enterprises. We have also produced a case study of best practices in IP utilization, also user guides as well. And uh, JCCI, uh, there have uh, been about five, there are currently 515 uh, branches, and we have an IP committee that has been installed. and. Uh, uh, we have had uh, the former uh, commissioner of JPO, Mr. Arai, Hisamitsu Arai, uh, served as a as the chair. The, and the JCCI 
Uh, we've encouraged the uh, small and medium sized enterprises to in use patents and other intellectual properties and to register for IP because uh, the intellectual property is a, a sign of the high level of uh, technology and also expertise. It will also be a uh, means by which to raise uh, transaction prices of, of their products as well. And also, it will also boost the morale of the employees as well. So we have uh, encouraged uh, the SMEs uh, to make the best of use of uh, intellectual property. And these are the companies uh, that have uh, been very, very active in uh, deploying intellectual property. We also find that the business performance of these companies are very, very uh, strong. And there are 300,000 uh, applications filed at the JPO and 15% is accounted for by small and medium-sized enterprises currently overall. The number of applications filed with JPO is actually declining. However, uh, within this entire picture, we find that the small and medium-sized enterprises are increasing the, the number of applications. And there's been also a discount uh, applied by the Japan Patent Office uh, when it comes to application fees to 50% of what it usually what it is in the United States. We find that the share of uh, SMEs is 25%, uh, Japan 15%. And therefore, we believe that there's uh, ample room for SMEs to increase uh, their application. Look at the next page. Uh, this indicates the utilization of intellectual property among the small and medium-sized enterprises. I believe that there are about three. Uh, the companies can be categorized into three. And the first of which is uh, the t companies that have a very, very strong uh, IP strategy. Uh, they're intent on using their intellectual property rights. And uh, they are also... Uh, steer to achieve autonomy and they are willing to protect their invention by patent uh, patent rights and also they are also willing to uh, take infringement cases to court and we also have these uh, uh, brochures uh, that indicate the uh, case studies that we have conducted and the Japan patent office every other year have uh, uh, disclosed the blue chip companies And also, they've introduced uh, companies that have uh, made inroads overseas. And also in Ottawa, War, this is indicated as a so-called mecca uh, of a small and medium-sized enterprises. And uh, the JPO has also uh, published uh, companies that introduce uh, these companies with very high so the sophisticated levels of technology. And the second uh, have to do with uh, venture businesses. And please look at the next uh, slide. This gives just a sampling of startup companies when it comes to financing or otherwise uh, cultivating uh, marketing channels. Oftentimes, they require the help of uh, large companies, especially when it comes to going overseas or otherwise uh, to procure financing from banks. Uh, patent rights will serve as a very crucial role, and therefore, uh, companies need to be attentive. And in the case of Japan, there are about 2,000 companies here in Japan that are startups overall. Uh, it is said to run to about 10,000. But that's just about where we are in terms of venture companies, especially in DX and also a bio uh, field. The startup are increasing. However, even while there's a high level of conscientiousness, when it comes to the knowledge of intellectual property, that is uh, stu that suffers. Uh, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises as uh, uh, startup companies, what they require access is uh, the uh, information because oftentimes uh, they're confronted by the risk of uh, their technology being exploited by larger uh, par uh, partners. And therefore, it is important to uh, provide uh, help to the startup companies by providing, say, templates of uh, what would be the appropriate contract to be uh, to put into place. And third party, their category are the small and medium-sized enterprises that are embedded into the supply chain. Up until the 80s, Toyota Nissan, these are uh, auto companies, and also Hitachi, uh, Toshiba Panasonic, in the uh, electric uh, area. The small and medium-sized enterprises, they were very, very numerous when it comes to uh, subcontractors, of course, that they have a very, very high level of uh, expertise and also quality. And therefore, what they have done is really to uh, help the growth of the large companies and to have uh, contributed to the international competitors of large companies. 
and grew as the Japanese economy experienced growth as well. However, in the 90s, when larger companies began to shift their manufacturing bases overseas, a small and mid-sized enterprises were uh, left behind. They could no longer enjoy the spillover of manufacturing technology and also quality control management skills from the mega companies. And what's more, more technology has been now transferred to companies outside of Japan. Uh, this is a case of IP drain. That these uh, three third category small and medium sized enterprises can no longer count on technology transfer from major companies and hence need to achieve higher levels of technology and roll out new products and services. And this calls for investment into intangible assets, patent application, and management of trade secrets. IP management is therefore very, very crucial. On page seven and onwards, uh, I've indicated uh, what is uh, crucial for SMEs. Uh, as we can see in the uh, IP headquarter uh, discussion, Japan's growth rate is less than 1%, and the West is about 1.5%. In China, uh, it's much higher, so we are suffering in comparison, and we are seeing also declining in uh, population as well, which also means that we need to pick up on labor productivity. And the GDP per capita uh, is still very, very low. There's much to be wanted here in Japan, and that is what is indicated on page eight on page seven rather, and now going on to page eight, uh, we are looking at the labor productivity. Uh, we are comparing the small and medium-sized enterprises vis-a-vis -vis the large companies. And compared to large companies, we find that the labor productivity among the small and medium-sized enterprises is suffering. So we need to really pick up on the labor productivity, which also means that uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises, there's ample room for growth. So it can be translated as well as such. And now moving on to page nine, and this is a very interesting piece of data, and this uh, has been placed on the SME white paper. To the left, we have the per capita nominal uh, at a value. And the beige color indicates the growth in terms of the, uh, to the actual effective uh, lower productivity rate. And we can see there is a growth. So in terms of the effective uh, growth rate, it's a substantial, however, down below the reddish color or rather orange. This is uh, indicates uh, a price uh, transfer uh, pass off rate when there is a rise in the parts, prices of parts. The question is uh, whether it can be uh, passed through onto the uh, selling price. We find that uh, it, that is not very possible when it comes to small and medium-sized enterprises. And how about the larger companies? That's to the right. And uh, we've introduced a case with a major comp the top of a major company. And I've indicated how they're uh, really intent on protecting their intellectual property right. However, we must also recognize that small and medium-sized enterprises in the negotiation with the larger companies need to be empowered they need to really hone up their skills and devise a firm IP strategy. And lastly, I would like to present some challenges on the policy, on the system front. And uh, if I introduce the measures on page 11, and then now uh, please turn to page 12. For intellectual property to demonstrate its uh, potential, and that is what is crucial here in Japan. Um, patent rights are synonymous with excessive rights, and therefore it is uh, allows us allows companies to differentiate their products as well as their services, and also it will help uh, address infringement as well. However, as I pointed out, among the small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, they have very uh, little capacity when it comes to confronting uh, challenges to their patent rights. And therefore, we find that there are many uh, management leaders who are uh, very concerned about what they can do in order to protect their intellectual pro property rights, because even if they file for an infringement case, oftentimes they are confronted by the challenge of uh, uh, invalidation of their patent or otherwise uh, losing the case. I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kugai. Um, 
I'd now like to ask our uh, panelists to explore in a little more detail the themes that they have raised. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, you, Mr. Kugai. Your organization, JCCI, has many members. And without mentioning a particular company name, if you do not wish to, uh, would you please provide an example or two of how a small enterprise has uh, successfully employed intellectual property to grow and compete as you wish to see from your presentation? Over to you, Mr. Kugai. Hi. To begin with, Japan has promoted or encouraged innovation from the Meiji era. The measures have uh, begun and prolonged, and we see the likes of Toyota, automotive ma manufacturer, Itaya Sakichi. Toyota Sakichi is, uh, uh, of course, the founder, and he has uh, patented the invention, uh, which have uh, allowed him to reap the rewards. And also from Panasonic as well, uh, we have uh, Konosuke Mazushita, who has also patented his invention and also post war, the JII have uh, announced the 100 cases, and we have uh, Nishin Foods, the instant noodles and cup noodles have been invented by the founder in the absence of a of a laboratory. An invention has come along, and such activities are more active these days. And Shimaseki in Wakayama Prefecture. Uh, which has also been introduced in Nikkei, and they have the knit knitting machine. Uh, they are listed today, but in the 1960s, uh, this uh, invention came about. Today, the profitability is very, very high, and also the top line is very, very strong, and they service at uh, uh, apparel's brand companies. They deliver this uh, weaving, or rather knitting machine, and we find the founders are very, very attentive to the patent rights. What is important is for the employees and uh, uh, the company Wakayama, the founder of the company Wakayama has also encouraged the employees to uh, be attentive to the needs of uh, their customers and also to engage in research that will deliver invention. And Kyoto company, a company called Nafil, this is an automatic egg uh, sorting machine and also packaging machine. It was in 1970s that they were begun, and there are 180 employees with a six billion top line, a very typical uh, company, the company called Navel, and they have the automatic exordium packaging machine. I'm sure you very well know they have 80% of the domestic share overseas, they have 20% uh, share, and they have an uh, international patent. It just so happens this company uh, did not have a, did not register a patent, but from the United States, uh, they were uh, brought a in infringement case from the United States, and they have decided to file for a patent, and thereafter, uh, they're always attentive as to whether there's an infringement against their patents, and they're also attentive to uh, registering for a necessary patent to protect their rights, protect their investment, and this has also contributed to their top line. So, uh, finally, for a patent, and the revenue from the patent has uh, enabled these companies to uh, enhance their technology and it's a, a virtuous cycle. And all these founders understand that IP rights are important and they have uh, uh, asserted, made that claim uh, in public. And by communicating on these thoughts, uh, uh, third parties uh, are now very well aware that they should not infringe on the rights of these companies. And also overseas operations Oftentimes, the Japanese companies uh, render all of the, delegate all the responsibility to a third party overseas. So uh, the technology is licensed out to the third party in the overseas channels. It is important for to be very attentive about how they should go about protecting their rights overseas. Thank you very much, Mr. Kugai. Your list reads like a gallery of uh, Japanese uh, legendary entrepreneurs. Uh, the um, 
Next topic I would like to uh, pursue in a little more depth uh, is for Professor O'Connor. Uh, trust is especially important in uh, industry generally, but especially in the healthcare industry. Uh, this is an area where Japanese and American companies would seem to be very much at an advantage because they have a reputation for uh, high quality and reliable goods and services. Uh, would you describe the importance of intellectual property to branding and to building a reputation for a smaller enterprise? Professor O'Connor? Yes, thank you. It really was a perfect setup for the listing of the amazing and famous Japanese brands and companies. Um, there's a famous quote that's attributed to a senior level executive at the American company Coca-Cola. I actually have never verified whether this is true, but it sums up the importance of branding and the protection of trademarks. The quote goes that even if Coca-Cola as a company lost all of its buildings and assets and everything else, as long as it still had the trademark rights, it could rebuild the next day. Why did he say that? Because investors would come in. That brand is so powerful that you can then completely restart the company from that. And in fact, in the United States, we have companies that were famous at one time, but then went away through bankruptcy, including the case of Polaroid, the instant film company. And now Polaroid is back in the marketplace, completely different people running it. And it's a very different company, but it's because of the strength of the brands. What do trademarks do at their core? They protect that goodwill and that trust in the marketplace. And that trust is critical. One challenge with trust is that if you are in a big national or international environment where you can't meet with people face to face, you do not have the interpersonal trust that you can rely on. So when businessmen are doing business in Tokyo and they know each other, they can operate on trust because that's the culture. And that is fantastic. However, when you start bringing those, the companies and doing things outside, especially outside of the country, now there's not necessarily the same culture. People don't know each other in the same way. And so trademarks are about that because what do trademarks do? They protect against confusion in the marketplace. They protect to ensure that if someone starts using a name or an image that looks a lot like what you have established as your brand protected by your trademark, that you can sue them to stop doing that. So they don't erode the trust that people can have in your products under your brand in the marketplace. Uh, thank you, Professor O'Connor. I think the key question then is how to do that. Uh, and uh, I would now like to turn to uh, Dr. Takanaka to uh, discuss a little more about her experience with US, Japanese, and European patent systems. Uh, in particular, Dr. Takanaka, um, how have you seen um, smaller enterprises navigate or overcome the legal and cultural differences between these systems as they seek to expand? Over to you. Thank you very much. There is a TRIPS trade related intellectual property rights, and therefore the system per se between Japan, United States, and Europe does not present large differences. However, Japan is government led, and so is Europe. But the United States is private sector led based on competition. So there is a, a different cultural difference. If you win, then you win everything in, in the United States. The risk is large. However, if you win, you are rewarded with a huge profit, and that's an incentive. In terms of the system, Japan and Germany, in terms of the system, in some way is more sophisticated. This is attributed to utility model system for the small and medium-sized enterprises and also startups. But not only that, but compared to the United States, the application fees are much, much lower. 
in Japan is 14,000 yen. It's about a little over 100 US dollars. Germany is much cheaper, 40 euros. In the United States, even if you are identified as a micro entity, you need to pay at least, you need to pay about $500. And on top of that, if you hire a patent attorney, the time charge is huge. And therefore, without procurement from investors, using the patent system prevents a formidable challenge. And in, in Japan, the patent attorney fees is very, very low. So that's a positive. And there are also discounts applied to small and medium-sized enterprises so that they can make better use of the intellectual property system. But on the other hand, venture companies, venture investors rather, and as of recent, their investors will buy up the patent and practice the rights on the inventor's behalf. And such a business model exists in the United States, which also indicates that there are various options that are not available here in Japan. And this also has to do with the culture in the United States culture evolves around a competition. If it's the best fit for people here, then they will be it would make better sense to start up a business in the United States and make the best use of the IP system in the States. Thank you, Dr. Takenaka. I think we've ended on a very practical note. Uh, the um, discussion this morning has been fascinating. Uh, we have looked at the broad changes in uh, the healthcare sector. We have thought about the future and our panelists have discussed how to build it. Um, I appreciate uh, your thoughts on how small businesses can best leverage their uh, proprietary assets and uh, your perspectives uh, on these larger issues as well. I trust that our audience uh, has found this morning's conversation informative, and I would like to thank the, everyone for joining. And with that, I will conclude and I will return the virtual floor to Kelsey to close out today's program. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Aaron. Before we end the program today, we'd like to invite our audience to take a short event survey. You will see the QR code uh, pop up on your screen shortly. While you take a moment to answer, I would like to thank our speaker, speakers, Dr. Iwami, Dr. Takanaka, Mr. O'Connor, and Mr. Kugai as well as my colleagues, Steve and Aaron, for sharing your time and expertise with us. And a special thank you to our Japanese Sign Language Interpreters from the Okinawan Prefecture Welfare Association for People with Disabilities, and our simultaneous interpreters and technicians at NHK. Lastly, we invite you to join us at upcoming programs and trainings on this and similar entrepreneurship topics. Please visit our website or social media for more information and to register. Thank you all so much again for joining us today. We hope that you continue to remain safe and healthy during these uncertain times. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.